Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the latest of the uh, Richmond uh, Council's community conversations. Normally, we will be sitting in front of you in a rather drafty community centre or church hall. However, owing to the current pandemic situations, we have embraced the white heat of technology and are trialling out this new system of uh, doing these by Zooms. And they're, they're working quite well at the moment. We've been having um, very good turnouts. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is uh, Councillor Gareth Roberts. I am the leader of the council. I am going to be the chair for the meeting. Um, hopefully, I won't have to do very much at all because you have uh, six excellent experienced councillors who will be here to answer your questions. You can look on me as being the, this sort of new lifeline that Clarkson offers on who wants to be a millionaire. So that I'm Ask the Host. So that if there is a, a question which stumps the collective brains of your councillors, then I may be able to leap in and help. Uh, but I doubt that that will be necessary. And um, there are some rules for the event. And the first one I should warn you of is that the event has been recorded and will be published after the event on the council website. So if you ask a question, do be pre-warned that um, your voice and possibly image will be shared for posterity on the council's website. Um, if you do want to speak, then what we are asking people to do is to write questions. There is a little chat function on this Zoom call. And if you'll find it, if you sort of hover your mouse over the um, keyboard or the, um, not mouse over the keyboard, hover your finger over the mouse and you will see a, a little chat function. Just write the word question in that box. And then when we come to the question and answer session, I will then scroll down and look for your, quest for your name and then call you out. Please don't use the raise hand function because it, it really messes up the, um, the people who are in the room in terms of being able to identify you. And please don't write the question or any other comments in the chat because it makes it very difficult for me to be able to then find out who the next question is coming from. And we have missed people out in the past. They got terribly shirty about the fact that um, they were not able to ask their question and all sorts of accusations of being muzzled by the council flying about so please don't write your questions in just write the word question and we will try to get through as many of them as possible um please uh, do switch on your video as it is so much more satisfying to see the people who are going to be asking the question and it brings everything to life um, if you can try and keep your questions brief that would be really helpful and then we can get through more questions um, all attendees have been sent the event etiquette and that's really to try to make sure that we all behave ourselves. We do have some sort of online bouncers who will, if anybody does start kicking off lightly, either in the chat or in their, when they're called to speak, then we, we, we will discreetly ask them to, to come into another online room and we'll have a quick word and hopefully get it all sorted out. So um, do be respectful of the speakers and other people who may have spoken before you. And uh, after the event, what we're going to be doing is trying to collate all the information that you may have heard this evening, whether it's individual web links or uh, bits of information, and we will be emailing you all of the details afterwards so that you can have a full record. If we don't reach your question, we will do our very best to um, email you afterwards and say, what was your question? And we will do our best to answer it for you because you've had the good taste to come along this evening with a question and we would like to be able to answer it for you. Um, so on to your panel. The panel that you have before us this evening are six ward councillors for Witten and Heathfield. We have Councillor John Coombs, Councillor Leslie Pelesha, and Councillor Michael Wilson representing Heathfield, and Councillor Joe Humphreys, Councillor Liz, Liz Yeager, and Councillor Rob O'Carroll representing Witten. Um, what we're going to kick off with first is a video. I'm afraid that the voiceover, which I did, is rather leaden and dull, and I apologise in advance for any feelings of you know, torpor or sleepiness that you may get when you see this, but it is full of useful information, but it's quite a dull voiceover, so sorry. Uh, so with that enticing prospect in mind, could I encourage the um, technical people who are helping me run this to please run VT. The first half of 2020 has been an extraordinary period for all of us. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a profound impact on all our lives. The Council has not been immune. The pandemic has brought huge challenges to us and to the way in which we deliver services to residents. Throughout the whole period, we have been committed to providing key services to all residents and help to those who need it most. As a snapshot of some of the things we achieved in just the first month of lockdown alone, 
We provided more than 6,000 hours of home care. We provided social care for over 1,600 vulnerable adults. We answered over 2,000 calls to our community hub. We provided 47 rough sleepers with accommodation. We delivered over 500 books directly to residents from our libraries and saw a 365% increase in people using our online library services. We had over 42,000 views of our online sports classes. We collected an estimated 47 tonnes of waste and recycling every day. And we kept our 51 schools open, providing education for over 500 children of key workers and vulnerable families. We know that things haven't always been perfect, and many people have been frustrated by some of the lockdown measures that have been put in place, and the fact that some of our services had to stop to ensure the safety of residents and staff. But we've been committed to prioritising those most in need. During this challenging period, I have been blown away by the continued incredible community spirit that we have seen across the borough. The pandemic has brought out the very best in so many of our residents, with neighbours providing a helping hand, the weekly clap for our carers and frontline workers, residents donating to food banks and the general willingness of so many to go above and beyond in their support for members of our communities. Following a call for volunteers, Richmond CVS received a staggering 3,000 applications from residents eager to help in any way they could. We have seen groups delivering food parcels, setting up virtual fitness classes, checking up on elderly residents that are shielding and collecting prescriptions. This generosity from residents and local groups has been genuinely humbling. And as we look to the future and towards recovery, we know that there are still huge challenges ahead. The recovery period provides us with an opportunity to make environmental changes that are needed across the borough and we have already started implementing some of these. For example, we have already started with our post-COVID-19 highway recovery strategy, looking at how we can ensure social distancing, encourage walking and cycling, and ensure our children can get to school safely. Over the next few weeks and months, we will be looking at other ways we can support local communities. And of course, residents will need to play their part in the future as they have done over the last few months. We've worked hard to ensure that businesses have received the funding they're entitled to, awarding a total of £35.79 million to over 2,100 local businesses. But now as our high streets begin to reopen, we all need to make sure that we support our local shops. Many of our businesses are run by local people, and if we don't use them, we will lose them. As we emerge from this difficult period, and look towards recovery, we want residents to come on board and provide us with their thoughts and ideas on how we can create a better borough for all of our residents. This moment provides the Council with an opportunity to reflect and improve the way we work and engage with residents, and your support and ideas are key to that. Thank you for coming this evening, and I look forward to hearing from you all. Well, there you go. Uh, spot of insight into what we've been doing over the last few months um, to keep the show on the road, to be honest. And I hope you'll agree that um, the figures in there were you know, really quite well. I, I think they're impressive. Now I'm starting to sound like some sort of town hall Trump, where I'm going to say, what well, a great job we're doing. David. But it has been a lot of work that's been going on on your behalf over the last few months. And talking of a lot of work which has been going on over the last few months, we're going to hear now from two of the water councillors that are going to give an update for um, each of their wards. So we have Councillor Jaeger, who is going to give an update for Witten Ward. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Roberts. Yes, I, I'm Liz Jaeger. I'm a, I've been a councillor in Witten for 14 years now, but uh, nothing there that compares at all to the last five months, which have been extraordinary and very difficult. But I think, uh, as that video shows, the council has risen to the occasion and uh, you know the community hub that was mentioned in that video kicked off the, the very day after lockdown was announced and did an extraordinary job and just uh, to give a bit of written context to say that uh, our area had more calls than any other part of the borough to the community hub 
which I think indicates some sort of um, need in the Witten and Heathfield area. And um, I think the community hub did an extraordinary job of trying to, to meet all those needs and they triaged and they got help to where it was needed, to the shielded and so on. And in doing that, of course, they were relying on a lot of help from voluntary organisations and in, in our area, our, um, our own local neighbourhood care group uh, with the network would have been helping out and uh, I know I heard from them fairly early on that uh, some of those hundreds, thousands of volunteers, of course, a lot of young people there, just the kind of people you need for something like Witten Network, where their normal volunteers possibly were shielding themselves. So, um, you know, this, this sort of thing ha has worked out very well. Um, so thank you very much to Witten Network and to all those people who helped them out. And I just also wanted to mention the schools. They're mentioned in that video. Um, there's a feeling, you know, the schools are opening in September. Well, no, they've, they've been open all the way through this. And uh, Richmond Borough has had more children at school uh, than the uh, country average. We've had a, a lot more. That requires an awful lot of work from the schools. You know, there has to be an individual risk assessment of every single child going in. And they've had these almost daily updates from the DFE about what they should be doing. I think it's been terribly stressful, very hard work. So just a, a thank you to Nelson School, to Chase Bridge, uh, to St Edmunds uh, for all they've done. And of course, all they're going to be doing, we're trying to open up more fully in September. Um, I think also now things are easing up a bit. Uh, thanks go very much to uh, the Witten Business Association, um, also known as Love Witten, for all they've been doing to help get the high street opening safely. They've done a lot of advice, you know, risk assessments, um, getting up safety screens, getting up distancing stickers. Um, and coming up will be a big shop local campaign. And I'd really encourage you to look out for that. I mean, I think you know, we've got a lovely high street in Witten, lots of independent shops, and we need to keep it going. And there'll be features coming up, shop local, featuring some of our good independent stores in Witten. So, so look out for that. Um, just to mention, um, on the high street, it's not, it's not in my ward, but the Halifax was due to close on the 23rd of June. And the Halifax had 10 branches closing across the country. They've made an announcement that none of those will close for the moment because of the extraordinary COVID situation. However, Barclays, in the midst of all this, announced that they were going to close um, this forthcoming October. And they're going through what I think we would all imagine is a bit of a tick box exercise to, uh, to do what they have to do when they announce a closure. But um, we will try very hard to persuade them that closing in the middle of COVID and telling their many, many customers that they should travel elsewhere to get to a bank is just not on at the moment. Uh, we talk about 20 minute neighborhoods and all that sort of thing. So we will try and, we'll try and stop this Barclays closure if we possibly can one way or another, but um, it's, it'll be an uphill struggle. So, um, there we are. What else? Um, talking of travel, I suppose the buses. When we had a community conversation, a real, not a, not a virtual one, one, two years ago, there was a lot of discussion about the bus changes coming up because it really does affect Witten. Both the 110 and the H22 will be changing. And uh, all those changes were fully explained back then. And now TfL have announced what's actually going to happen. And there's not much change, quite honestly, um, a few tweaks here and there. But the main thing is that the H22 won't terminate in Twickenham any longer. Um, it'll go on to the West Middlesex Hospital. So I think that'll be good news for a lot of people. Um, and if people have forgotten what the changes were going to be, um, look it up or you'll get some surprises in December. The main, I mean, for the 110, it's going to start going down Whitten High Street, which will be excellent 
for connecting a whole area of Whitman to its local high street and to the station and is something that people have been asking for for years, a lot of people. So that's good. Um, so I, I suppose the last thing, um, if I've got time to mention it, is uh, we have been looking at all sorts of safety issues on the roads. And uh, I think in Whitton and Heathfields, Hospital Bridge Road is a particular issue because of all the schools in that area and of course the forthcoming school as well. And there are several changes um, which have gone in recently to try to stop people overtaking on the bridge uh, to, you know, more double white lines on the road, reminding people of 20 miles an hour, um, cutting back a load of vegetation to make the footpath wider. Uh, but we're hoping to do a lot more than that and uh, we'll keep at it and try and get some movement on uh, a number of things there in the next 12 months or so. Okay. I think that's it. That must be my five minutes. So, uh, Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Sorry, thank Councillor you. Roberts, just one very small thing that um, we, we wanted to mention in this section um, was just to update people on Nella Hall um, to say that because of what's happened with COVID that it's not going to be closing this year, it will be closing next year uh, instead. So that's just a, a very brief update on, on that. Not at all. Thank you very much for that. It's a useful piece of information. Just just on the subject of um, Barclays in Witten. I used to live in Witten when I first came to university at St Mary's and I tried to open a uh, an account at Barclays in that branch and they, they, they turned me down. I was not the type of custom they wished to attract is what was written in the letter. So there we go. Um, we're moving now to a Heathfield update from Councillor Wilson. Thank you very much, Councillor Roberts. Um, and I just wanted to um, echo Councillor Jaeger's um, uh, thanks uh, to uh, the community, uh, our local neighbourhood care group and, and all of the volunteers that have been doing so much over the last few months. It's uh, been uh, incredible to see the kind of effort that's gone in. Um, and obviously we're aware that we're still sort of in the middle of everything that's going on. So we are keen as a local authority and as, uh, as, as wards because we know the need um, has been in this area to make sure that we build in some resilience to that over the next few weeks and months uh, to make sure that we can keep delivering on some of the things that we've been able to do um, making sure that um, people are getting food and people are getting the prescriptions and um, trying to sort of tackle some of the issues that are coming out of the COVID crisis so um, hopefully uh, hopefully things will ease up quicker than we hope but uh, if not then we are building in the, the systems to enable us to keep on delivering for local people. Um, I also wanted to echo my thanks to the schools, um, uh, you know, Bishop Perrin um, and Heathfield and uh, the wonderful Twickenham Secondary School who have uh, been absolutely fantastic in terms of the support uh, that they've been given to uh, local pupils. Um, I think it's quite incredible the amount of work that's gone in. I, I have a daughter who's a Bishop Perrin so I know how much um, effort that's been gone in not just to the keeping the schools open for key workers and for vulnerable children but also to provide for homeschooling for us parents who were trying to manage that process um, during lockdown. Um, I also just wanted to say um, thank you to um, for people, for uh, you know, neighbours and groups of people who have been springing up and, and delivering uh, services and help to their neighbours. It's been uh, very important um, and it's been great to see, you know, standing on the doorstep for the clap and also uh, just to kind of uh, you know getting stuff out to people so thank you for all that's been going on and I know uh, Witten Village our local sort of Facebook news group has been uh, providing updates to people so again I just to thank them for getting key information out as and when it's been coming up so uh, moving on to some of the um, issues um, and obviously one of the uh, big issues uh, and Councillor Jaeger mentioned it before is in relation to um, Turing House School, which um, uh, they still hope to open uh, next September. Um, uh, they, uh, they are currently, as a planning application, sort of gone in to try and discharge some of the conditions that were applied to them, uh, which is basically to try and speed up the process of getting the school built. Um, we've uh, moved on. I, I mean, obviously, the, the big news which came with regards to um, Turing um, in the last few months was that the London Mayor uh, enabled uh, the development to continue um, uh, given that the development has gone to metropolitan open land so um, now the sort of next stages of sort of getting that construction going is what's taking place and there are 
some conditions which are looking to be discharged. The other big issue in terms of the sort of uh, the area in relation to that is the crossing which is likely to go, which is going to go in um, in relation to uh, Montrose Avenue and Hospital Bridge Road. Um, we're expecting that to go into the planning. It's sort of being worked up uh, at the moment and we expect that to sort of go into the public domain um, shortly, I mean, very quickly. Uh, so um, we'll keep everybody updated about that. Um, another planning um, application which uh, has come up is around the Duke of York pub, which is at the corner of Paradigmill Lane and Hanworth Road. Um, that, as I understand, has now gone to the Planning Inspectorate. Um, uh, so uh, that will be looked into. It is a uh, community centre, some housing and some retail units on the, um, on the pub, which has been closed. Um, and residents will have noticed also that a sort of uh, um, an illegal sort of car washing operation has gone in uh, to into the car park of that site. So planning enforcement officers are on the case in terms of trying to uh, deal with that. Um, it is not, uh, it hasn't, they haven't sought a uh, proper license to uh, operate a business there. Uh, and so that is um, under enforcement action at the moment. Um, it has caused some problems in terms of queuing and things on Powder Mill Road and Hanworth. And with road. Uh, Liz uh, mentioned about the buses. Um, the uh, obviously the big change, as she mentioned, is the 1110 uh, running along uh, Powder Mill Lane uh, up Percy Road to the High Street, um, and then on to Richmond. Uh, so we uh, are conscious that that has um, lengthened the journey for uh, some people. Uh, from the Woodlawn Estate to the um, uh, the hospital, a direct connection to the hospital. Obviously, there is the 481, which stops at the bottom end. But we did um, unsuccessfully. We did lobby um, the TfL to uh, start the bus service at um, w the West Middlesex Hospital, and we're still campaigning to try and um, deliver that. But obviously, that will take a bit more time. And in relation to TfL, obviously, you'll have seen in the news they've based their financial problems um, over the last few weeks and months, uh, but we are making sure that they try to live up to the commitments made in relation to uh, Turing House School and the um, extra 481 services. Uh, just a couple of other uh, sort of smaller issues. Um, there is a new path uh, from the Hanworth Road to the play area uh, on just by the um, Hounslow Heath Estate. Uh, we are uh, we, we discussed whereabouts that would potentially go, and it was the sort of the most sort of uh, popular place for it to be. So, in terms of people using it, so that's where it's gone in. Um, the Witten Community Centre, uh, which has been a key centre both in terms of uh, just generally uh, for our for our area, but also in relation to the um, COVID crisis in relation to the food bank. Um, so, I know we've been working closely with. Um, staff and trustees and they've been working really hard to keep the centre going over the last few weeks and months and they are sort of working up their risk assessments to see how they can uh, continue that and open up the centre when it's safe to do so. So, um, you know, just a big thank you to everybody at Wynn Community Centre who have been uh, working really hard, both for the community and also in terms of opening up the centre. Um, we've obviously had some issues around refuse collection. I'm not going to go into it now. I maybe will come up in the uh, in the chat later on. Um, the, we've had some discussion around vergers. Um, some of the vergers are now being um, uh, being sort of addressed. Uh, we did have some issues in terms of um, staff shortages from continental landscapes. It did cause some issues in some of the more residential areas. But in some of the other areas, there was a um, one of the, as part of our climate strains climate change strategy, uh, we are trying to allow sort of increased biodiversity in some areas and that includes some of the verges. Uh, the Heathfield Rec has a new trim trail uh, which has been installed um, and the other final issue I just want to touch on was uh, Witten uh, CPZ which obviously came into operation just as the lockdown uh, came into effect. Um, that was the uh, CPZ sort of in the Montrose Avenue, Jubilee Road and Pauline Crescent uh, area and it was on the other side of Witten uh, High Street as well, Constance Road I think. Um, the, uh, obviously the, the impact was to try and tackle some of the commuter parking and obviously that quickly disappeared um, uh, as a result of the lockdown uh, but just to kind of give everybody a reassurance those kind of patrols are stepping up again. Um, I know in the 10 days prior to August the 1st, 
because uh, I looked this up specifically in case we were asked about it. 10 days prior to August the 1st, uh, we had um, 128 patrols logged and there were 100 PCNs issued. So I can assure people that the CPZ is being enforced. Um, and um, obviously, uh, if there are any particular issues, people can call the parking uh, enforcement hotline. But just to kind of give everybody the reassurance that even though the kind of commuter traffic is starting to kind of come back into things, then it is being enforced. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, what we're going to do now, we, we have a new initiative which is uh, coming out of the council, don't worry. It's a new initiative um, and it's what we're trying to do. We're, we're terribly good, people say, at taking money away and not too good at giving it back. However, this is a new initiative which has been spearheaded largely by Councillor Wilson. Um, it's called the Richmond Community Fund and it is don't, I mean, don't get excited, it's not apes, peacocks and ivory by any means, it's £10,000 per ward. But when you consider that we have 18 wards, that's £180,000 which is going to be invested by this council um, into your local area. And we have a short presentation with a far better voiceover um, this time. So if we can now stand by with that particular presentation, and then after this we're going to go into questions, um, of which I see there are none in the chat at the moment. So it could be a short old evening, folks, if you don't start um, asking your questions or at least letting us know that you would like to ask one. So if we could now hear all about the Richmond Community Fund, that would be lovely. Thank you. I'll get the name right. Yeah, the local Sorry. area. Yeah, it's the local area fund, not the Richmond Community Fund. It's, it's, it's designed for detail, which has put me in this big office. So, local area fund video now. A new £180,000 fund has been launched to help support community-led projects in every ward in the borough, helping to rebuild local areas and connect communities after the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. The £10,000 pot for each ward is intended to support local initiatives helping launch new ideas and developing projects to make a positive difference to our borough. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a widespread impact on how we deliver services and support local people. We welcome all ideas on how to improve your local area, particularly those that aim to help rebuild our communities, connecting people and finding new ways of supporting each other. Any individual, local group, charity or business can submit an idea or apply for a grant. Applications need to demonstrate how the project meets one or more of the following priorities. Enable local people to develop, agree and deliver their own responses to local issues and build stronger communities. Make public places more attractive, enjoyable and distinctive. Support local initiatives that address the causes of climate change and minimise the environmental impact of carbon, waste and pollution to protect the future of our borough and our planet. Promote the vitality of our town and neighbourhood centres. Widen participation in sports and physical activity. Enhance the artistic and cultural offer and protect the borough's heritage. Improve health and well-being. Improve crime prevention. Improve community assets. Before you apply, you will need to discuss your idea with your ward councillor to see how it fits with local priorities. You can do this by sharing your idea online or contacting your ward councillors directly. And then, your idea will be reviewed by ward councillors and officers to recommend next steps for your idea. This may include an application to the local area fund, but could also include signposting you to another source of support or funding for your idea. If the idea is suitable for the local area fund, we will invite you to submit a formal application. Once a complete application has been submitted, it will then be reviewed and we'll let you know if it has been successful. We look forward to hearing from you. So there you go, um, a new fund. This is going to be running alongside other existing sources of funding. So if you have questions about it, then uh, please approach your local ward councillors. And if you have suggestions, start thinking about them now. Okay, so we are now into the main point of the evening. And for the first time ever, we're actually on time. One minute past seven, not bad. So we have our first question, which is in the chat. And we're going to go straight to Graham 
would. If I can just remember, remind everybody that we're on the council shilling, so no breezy political points, please. And that goes for both councillors and for question sets. Mr Wood. Thank you. Um, it's just a quick question about the CPZ and business to getting the permits for it. Um, Mr Wood, you're a little... Could you just move closer to the microphone? I have to speak louder. Can you hear me all right? Just, yes. You can. Hang on. Let me just see if I can turn the, turn the mic up a bit. Hold on. Go to someone else and I'll play around with the mic. I'll see if I can turn the mic up. Okay, we'll go, we'll, we will go to, um, we'll get to, well, it says Robert here, and I'm sure we all know him as Bob. Bob King? Hear me. Going, there you go, Bob. Uh, you can now hear me, I take you it. You can always hear you, Bob. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the voice is fading a bit. <laughs> um, question about the refuse collection. Uh, I uh, wondered whether the... Uh, custom of uh, collecting every two weeks my uh, uh, bin for uh, food uh, is continuing or whether it's part of the new council policy or whether it's a glitch uh, in the collection. So would somebody like to answer that? Okay, so it who, who fancies? It was uh, collected today, not last week, Collected the week before, but not the week before that, and I forgot what happened before that. Who, who, who wants to take this one? Is that Liz, here we go. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to. It's a glitch, Cole. <laughs> it's not supposed to be happening. Oh. <laughs> so, um, we better report it, hadn't we? Uh, well, um, it, it was certainly reported no. many times. Well, um, all I can do is say sorry. Um, I mean, Councillor Wilson mentioned that we've been getting a bit of casework on all this. And I mean, it was in the video, it extraordinary tonnage being collected at the moment. People have said it's like Christmas every week, you know, because of people at home and uh, all the online deliverers as well and um, so on. But uh, nevertheless, you should be getting your food waste taken every week. Uh, so I'll report it as well. And um, let's hope you see an improvement. Sorry. I hope it will be done next week. If not, mm. I'll let you know, Liz. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the other thing is, if I can piggyback, Go the, on. Harvest, the harvest is now ready for gathering in Bramley Close and has been ready for some time. All the grass is nine foot high. Um, I've asked about that one as well. It's kept the dog walkers off. <laughs> yes, well, I think that was covered in the video too, that um, our the people, continental landscapes, um, they've, and other, you know, they've been putting an awful lot of effort oh, into sure. trying to keep our parks as, yeah. as good as they can be. I'm sure uh, everyone has had their work cut out the parks have just been used so much more. So um, th there's a question of priorities, but there is also this issue that an uncut verge or area of grass is immensely more beneficial to wildlife. Oh, indeed. 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 Nevertheless, of course, when they do cut them one day, they'll have to do a bit of litter picking probably. So, um, will. you know, it's a bit of swings and roundabouts, but nevertheless, I'm quite sure that grass in Bramley Close and some others I've heard about will get cut sooner or later. They're starting, they are starting to do it, yeah. They are indeed. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bob. Okay, can we go back to Mr. Woods? Graham? Just going to unmute you, there we go. We can give it a try. Yeah, that's, that's, better. that's better. We'll All listen right. hard. Okay, not a problem. It was just a quick one on the CPZs. I know I have asked about this previously, but we have some businesses in the high street that have applied for business permits for the CPZ to be told they can't have one because their shop's on the wrong side of the high street. And I just wanted to know if there was any update on that because some of the shops are asking. Um, the ones that are on the odd numbered side aren't allowed a permit because they live on the wrong side of the high street to get a business permit, which is a little bit silly really. One for the ward uh, councillors and for me to, you know, heroically dodge. Um, who fancies this one? Um, 
Joe. Oh, oh, yeah. So, um, so we did get an answer on that. Um, at the moment, the border of the CPZ goes down the middle of the road. Um, so the shops on the Cypress Avenue side of the high street are not included in the zone and therefore they are not entitled to um, business permits. Um, we think, like I'm sure you do, that that's a little bit ridiculous. Um, and so when the review comes up for the whole uh, CPZ zone, uh, that is certainly something um, that we can um, advocate that the, those businesses should um, be included in the zone uh, going forwards so that they can get business permits. So um, it, it's, it's something that's happened, but when the whole thing is re-looked at, um, definitely the businesses on, on that side of the road, um, we think, should be able to, to apply for business permits and we will be uh, advocating on your behalf and on all the businesses' behalfs to have that included at the review. Do we know when that is, just so I can let them know? Um, the problem with the reviews um, is that to do it, normally it's six months. And what one does is you, you look at the effects that a CPZ has had. So in, in Witten and Heathfield, we've got two CPZs that came in just before lockdown. So we had the one by the station and we had the other one down uh, by the stadium, by Chase Bridge School. Um, and the problem is, is that you look at the data and you look at what has actually happened and has come out of those CPZs. And the problem is, is that we've been in such extraordinary times that we don't have any data, reliable data to look at. So we don't know whether there would be displacement into other streets from commuters because there have been no commuters. Um, for example, down at the Chase Bridge end, both the school and the college and the RFU conferences and Virgin Gym and all of the, the, the reasons that were behind the parking pressures just haven't been in existence so we don't have the data um, so uh, as much as we're keen to get the review done there's no point in doing it um, until um, until we've got the, the, the right information in order to do it I mean I think what we could do is go back and say that if it's the review is going to be delayed for all those reasons can they look at the side of the high street um, first um, but one of the questions actually, Graham, I'd have for you is that given that there's been less pressure on parking, um, have they not been able to park on the Cypress Avenue side because there's been no commuters? Um, it's still quite busy there, but it's more a case of the businesses have applied for the permits and have been told no, they can't have them. Right. And the businesses are quite happy to pay for the permits um, so because otherwise they do have nowhere to park. OK, well, what I'd ask, would you mind finding out whether they're really struggling to find space at all? Because obviously, if they can park on the Cypress Avenue side, they can actually park for free at the moment. Um, if they're struggling to find space, then I think it's something we need to try and expedite and get that done a bit quicker. If they're managing to find space because the commuter levels are down um, and, you know, the schools are closed and all of those sort of things, um, then it potentially can wait for the review. But if you could feed back to us on that, um, we'll, no, we'll try and get that pushed forward. No, but no, no. yeah. That was a very long answer to, I don't know when the review is going to happen. Okay. That's right, not a problem. Thank you. Thank you for your question. We're going to go to Linda Hance now. And we're just going to unmute you, Linda, and then you can ask away. Hi. Um, Hello. Two questions. Um, the first one is as a local resident in Witton, uh, we have to drive down Witton Dean frequently. Witton Dean, the borough boundary between Hounslow and Richmond goes down the middle of the road and so the middle of the road suffers from terrible potholes, it's never resurfaced and it causes huge damage to cars. Um, and I know loads of people have raised it over and over and over again and then someone, I don't know whether it's Hounslow or Richmond, comes along, slaps a bit of tarmac in the worst potholes but again if you drive down there right now it's the whole of the centre of the road is one long pothole, right from um, Junction with Hounslow Road right down to Tesco's. And I'd like to know, can the two councils please just get together and share the cost and do it properly for a change? My so, understanding, I think, well, Liz, is that it's Hounslow. Sorry, Liz, carry on. You, you're... No, no, I was, um, I'm, I'm sorry, Linda, but it's entirely Hounslow's road. Um, and it is entirely Hounslow's responsibility to resurface it. It has got so bad at times in the past that we have lobbied them from here to surface it. Um, but 
Um, the road is theirs and so is the pavement actually along Whitton Dean. Um, uh, the boundary starts at the end of people's front gardens. So um, we, you know, by all means write to Hounslow Council, but that is, uh, that's whose responsibility it is. But what, what we could do is, um, I, I'm fairly sure one of the councillors in that ward um, is um, one of my kids' teachers. Um, oh, so uh, <laughs> so uh, he, won't, he won't thank me for this, but um, I'll try reaching out to him um, and, uh, and try and use the influence of my small child um, to see whether we can, we can get some, some movement on that. But um, we can certainly reach out to them. But as Liz has said, unfortunately, um, right up to people's uh, front gardens, it's, uh, it's Hounslow's responsibility. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'll, I'll be able to let people know who mentioned it to me. Um, the second thing is on behalf of Friends of Murray Park, I'm the treasurer and Michael here is the chair. Um, We've had an increase during the lockdown um, and the good weather of um, nighttime problems and an excess of drug um, um, selling, drug dealing. Um, the police have attended um, late at night occasionally and, and chased people and caught them and arrested them. But it's happening frequently, pr pretty much every night in, in and around the skateboard park end at Nella Road. We've talked to parks. Um, Park guards are fully stretched, even though I believe Richmond Council has given them some extra hours. They're just not coming out. They don't come out that time of night anyway. And it's midnight when it's, you know, between about 11 and 1 in the morning it's happening. Um, and I just think uh, we need to have a different approach now. Okay, who'd like to take up uh, Murray Park? Well, not, not take up Murray Park drug dealing, but tackle the question of Murray Park drug dealing. Uh, I will ask one of you to do it if you don't come <laughs> forward. <laughs> well, I, it's it's just that I do regularly attend the um, police liaison group meetings when they happen, but of course they are happening virtually as well. And uh, so, you know, I have that contact with the police. But um, it's, I, I mean, well, Councillor Roberts will well know because we've seen this going on across the borough. There's been some extraordinary issues in you know, Richmond Green and Twickenham Green and various parks. And um, as you say, Linda, the uh, park guard and others out there, they're stretched. Um, but certainly um, the next police liaison group meeting is coming up, I think in early September. We can get the question as it were to them before that and see if this can be discussed in, in, in that forum, um, but also to see, you know, what, what, if anything, they can be doing about it through August, because, you know, one wants, <laughs> but I imagine they're doing whatever they can with the resources they've got. But thank you for telling us, and I'll, I'll, I will certainly pick that one up with the police. And, and Park Guard and, you know, people. Leslie, did I just see you um, beckoning to come in, Leslie Palesha? Let me just unmute you. There we go. Oh. There we go. Is this to shut me up? No. <laughs> no, just to echo what Liz said, um, if, if you want to email me with the details, um, I, I will contact the police for you as well. Because um, Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm sort of keeping an eye on on the wreck as well, and uh, all over the place. So if you if you want any extra help, um, please email me, and I'll I'll try and help you. Excellent. Okay, so uh, Linda, does that answer your question? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, you're you're muted. Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, I can see a couple of people are waving at me through the screens, and uh, we can't we can't do that because otherwise. We, we, we've got a set level, so do you just type question and I'll come to you. Okay, so um, Eric Gilston is our next questioner. Eric? Um, sorry, Councillor Roberts, I think that Lula's saying that her chat uh, function isn't working. Oh, so, I see. So could okay. you put, so could, if you could pop Lula on the list, that would be yeah. fantastic, thank you. Sorry, Lula. It's, it's, the, it's the, the joy of modern technology. Well, 
Okay, so Mr. Gilston. Okay, my question relates to the 20 mile per hour initiative in the borough. And what I would like to know is how are the council measuring the success or otherwise of this particular initiative? Okay. I, I'm, I'm looking around. <laughs> I mean, what I can tell you, Mr. Gilson, is of course we will be getting accident and collision data from uh, the Met Police. Of course, at the moment, data coming in is, is, is a bit hard to come by because of the difficulties of entering into any real form of um, quantitative sampling. It simply is arising from uh, COVID. Um, is it COVID or COVID? You can never tell. Um, but that's where the issues come in. What we're I mean, I have to say from my personal experience, I mean, there's, there is a, a consideration that um, the 20 mile an hour is some sort of crusade against the motorists. I, I drive um, fairly regularly. I see my anecdotal evidence, and perhaps I'm biased, is that there are the you know, quieter, calmer, and albeit safer roads. So there, there's no actual the empirical evidence yet. But what I would say, is that the um, my post bag, and I don't know about the councillors who may wish to come in at some point. Um, the council, my post bag, rarely ever now features comments about 20 mile an hour. Um, there was a huge amount of um, concern at the beginning about all sorts of apocalyptic uh, um, visions about what it would deliver, but I've not had anybody contact me for ever such a long time. I can see that Councillor Coombs is wanting to come and rescue me. So, Councillor Coombs. <laughs> Yes, um, it was really to say, we, you, you have to understand, uh, Mr. Gilston, that this is a, not only a Richmond initiative, it is an initiative across the majority of London boroughs, because London itself has set the task of being a zero death road city um, as soon as possible. Uh, the um, Last figures I saw was that London-wide deaths were running at 900 a year. Um, the initiative of 20 mile an hour across most of London and the city as well is that um, if you're hit by a vehicle traveling below 27 miles an hour, you tend to live. If you're hit by a vehicle traveling at 29 miles an hour, you tend to die. And it, the initiative is to actually reduce the number of deaths on the road. Um, and, the, uh, and this is what the initiative is about in the main. Um, so 20 miles an hour, we will eventually get this statistics because as I say, currently, the statistic is 900 deaths a year. Um, if the 20 mile an hour is successful, that will come way down and there'll be far fewer deaths on our... I understand, on our I understand what you're saying, but uh, what we've never seen is how many deaths there were in the borough prior to this initiative. And also, what we're also not seeing is how much money the council are making from this at the moment. Oh, I can tell you that, Mr. Gilson. We're oh, not making yeah. a single brass farthing, uh, because we don't... Uh, councils are not allowed, under law, to levy um, speeding fines. So we're not making a brass farthing out of it. In terms of the number of deaths, um, there were, there's plenty of information which is on the council website relating to the, um, all the materials for the consultation, which did have um, details relating to both um, fatal and non-fatal collisions um, across the years prior to the implementation. So it's all that it's still there. What we've kept it, we've kept it all up there because we're not one of these um, councils that suddenly <laughs> hides all of the consultation material. So yes, it's all still there. Any other councillors wish to come in? Well, I, 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 I would just concur that um, I've not had any, um, I've not had any casework about it. Uh, Liz. Thank you, Joe. Liz? And I was going to say almost the same thing. The one piece of casework that I have seen about it was pleading with us to reinstate the 20 mile an hour limit because they thought it had been lifted in lockdown because of course there has been this, it's been, there has been a bit of speeding with the empty roads. And uh, again, you know, like so many other things, it's difficult to take a measure 
of something in these very odd circumstances. But um, no, I haven't, apart from that one email I've seen about, you know, please can we have 20 miles an hour um, around here? Um, no, I, I haven't had anything. There we go. Hope okay. this answers a... Yeah, so, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gilson. Okay, we're going to move to Janet Goddard. Now, Janet, I'm not quite sure I understand um, the question you're asking, but maybe you can um, elucidate on the subject. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, of course. Hello. Okay, okay. so there's actually, I've tried to sneak in four questions, so I do realise I'm being a bit... Um, so the first thing was that they were talking about, um, you were talking about funding for things that are in the areas, the initiatives. Okay. And I was wondering if, if people come forward as a group and they've got an initiative, are those likely to be publicised so that if someone hasn't got an idea of their own but they want to do something in the community, they could maybe join a group? Okay, shall we answer that one first? Councillor Wilson. Okay. Good idea. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, I mean, uh, the, it, it's supposed to be a dialogue um, with uh, ward councillors and, and the community. So obviously, um, it's slightly different circumstances, which we would hope to be uh, launching this particular scheme. But um, uh, yes, there's no, there's no reason at all why we wouldn't publish the sort of stuff that comes in. So, and um, I, would, I would hope, um, you know, we will use whatever channels we can to sort of um, publish what, what is coming in. It'll certainly, we can make them available as ward councillors, so. Okay. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then there's, there's two environmental sort of things, I guess. And it was, it was Leslie that's, that made me think of one of them. Uh, because she spoke of the wreck. Um, so one of them was uh, recently there's been the leak into Crane Park. Is there any update on that? And then kind of connected to that, there was play equipment that was burnt on the wreck. And is there any update on that? Okay. <coughs> yes, Leslie, you're unmuted. You may fire away. Yeah, no, just with regard to the leakage into the crane, because obviously it's just around the corner from me, I haven't received any further update. I'm not quite sure where it started. But uh, I'm intending actually to go over there tomorrow and uh, have a look to see if anything's been done about it. So um, I'll post that up on, on Witten Village afterwards. Brilliant. Leslie, I, okay. I think I, I saw that the potentially there was an outlet pipe at Saxon Avenue. Yes, sir, but that's correct. That's yeah. correct. It was something to do with Saxon Avenue, but I haven't had any updates since then. Okay, and the burn play equipment? That's still an open um investigation as far as we know mm. okay. okay as soon as we have more information we will update residents on that and um you had a fourth question which i'm going to allow uh, janet as you've been uh, <laughs> admirably brief in your question so fourth thank you it's, it's very final one you were talking about the 20 mile an hour speed limit um i saw on the witten site the other day there's been complaints about people racing around witten there seems to be a group of people racing is there any information on that okay who wants to take this um, I, I, I mean, my answer would be no, because I don't know any information on it, whether that means there is no information, I don't know. But if you want to tell us which part of Witten it is, um, email one of the councillors, we can, we can look into it. Um, I've, I've certainly heard about speeding on Hospital Bridge Road in the past, but uh, I, I'm not sure which area you're talking about. Okay, okay. So it was just a thing on the Witten site where people were saying apparently there was a group of people that were racing in the evening that was getting louder and louder. Yeah, um, that's all I have on it. Unfortunately, yeah. I've spoken with um, Sally Benatar, who's the borough, chief, uh, borough commander, the chief superintendent. She tells me that um, speeding is now up across the whole of London during lockdown. So it's, it's, oh. uh, it is something that the police are aware of and are determined to tackle. Thank you very much for this for admirably brief. Oh, Michael. <laughs> Sorry, Gareth. Uh, well, just on that part, I mean, because there's the issue, there's a speeding issue, but there's also this idea that there's some kind of coordinated racing going on, which I I have picked up as well, and I I certainly can hear things um, at a certain time of night, uh, and you'll hear the sort of uh, the cars that that, that are uh, probably the um, uh, the reason behind it. So I, we can follow up in terms of try. I, it, I, if, if residents have got any particular information as to kind of where they're doing it, I mean, as, as Liz mentioned, I mean, we're aware that sometimes it happens on Hospital Bridge Road. Um, but if you if you are aware of where it's regularly happening, um, then do let us know and we'll follow up with the local police team. Thank okay. You. 
Thank you for your questions. Now, before it slips my mind, Lula Gorman, I have unmuted you. You had a question which you wished to ask? Yes, I wanted to ask, can you hear? Yes, we can. I wanted to ask about fly tipping, which is horrendous around here. Um, we've, is it possible to get a notice up? I don't know who's in charge of saying, this is a criminal offence. If you do it, you're going to be prosecuted. We've got people dumping outside the charity shops, which are closed. It's disgusting. Yeah. Something, can something please be done? Sure. So just to clarify, is it is it specifically the charity shops that we're looking at or, or are there other hot spots within either Heathfield or Witten you're thinking of? Well, apparently, according to the local website, next door website, there are other places. I'm aware of it in Witten High Street. Yep. Outside the charity shop. Uh, bingo. Oh. It really, I mean, is it possible for a notice to say, you do this, you get done? It's the only language that's understood around here. Thank you. Who wants to tackle that? I mean, this is, this is not just a, a, a Witten issue. It's up and down the boroughs, the charity shops. Who wishes to? Um... Uh, well, I'm happy to. It's not, I mean, it's Witten Ward, but I'm, I mean, because yeah. I, I, I walk up to the high street fairly frequently um, and every other day I'm sort of taking a photograph of uh, uh, something outside the... Um, uh, cancer research uh, charity shop or one oh. of the other ones so um, I know a note has gone up um, uh, it's it's there's a so there were there was a sort of a, a a note I think most of the charity shops have put something in um, and then uh, that was to have no impact yes no no I know and then a sort of a, a there's a council one up now in the cancer research shop um, but again it's not uh, it's not and it's costing every time uh, we get it cleared uh, it's costing you know it costs taxpayers money so um, well, can we not uh, it's, have it's... the law can we not have them threatened with threatened with prosecution well it's about it's about catching people in the act or having the evidence to so uh, normally with fly tipping we we have uh, that there, there is law which is available to us if we're able to um, uh, have evidence as to where that has come from and usually I don't know I don't know specifically about the charity shops but I know in the past certainly at the bring sites which are uh, the, the one on Nella Road and the one on Powder Mill Lane uh, we, where we've we've had a sort of dumping of things we have gone to, not personally but the, the, the council has gone through it to try and find information which would link it back to somebody where it's been dumped but again it's very difficult to prove so um I, we try every time that it's, something it, is dumped it goes through it, it would it not help if there was something other than the charity shop themselves putting a notice up is it not possible to get something from the police the council how do you do it well a council one as i say that it's certainly in the in cancer research a council one has gone up um uh, but I, again, it's one of those things which I, I, I mean, I, I don't think it'll have a great deal of impact uh, other than, um, unfortunately, unless we had somebody standing over the shop for the 24 hours a day to try and prevent it. Uh, the, chari the problem also, the charity shops, I mean, some of them are starting to open, but obviously they've got an excess of stuff, uh, which they're trying to work through. Um, and quite honestly, um, if it doesn't get dumped in the front of the charity shops, then it, it gets dumped somewhere else. So. I don't think there are any open on Whitton High Street yet. It's something we'll keep under review, Ms. Gorman. Oh, Councillor Jaeger wishes to come in. Well, I've, I've noticed um, that the Whitton Business Association have something to say on this issue. Yeah. And I'm, I think I know what they're going to say, but it's, it's, I, I, it's better coming from them. And I, if I, I think I'm going to you, support Graham? what gets said. So if you could let Graham in, that would be good. It's on fly tipping at the back of the shop. I think. Well, it's fly tipping at the back so of the where, shop. Where is Graham? I'm here. I'm the one talking now. Hello. Right. Um, two things. One, you say the charity shops. We are actually in contact with all the managers of the charity shops. And as soon as stuff is dumped outside, we are either emailing their head office or we're letting them know that stuff's been put outside. Um, as I think it was Michael said, you have to catch them in the act or have a name and address for them to be able to actually prosecute. But haven't we got CCTV? 
And to, unless they've got ID sticking out the back of them, you don't know who they are on camera. You still have to catch them, and the CCTV backs up that evidence, um, or they have to be recognised. Um, and to be honest, I think if they're going to be fly tipping, they're not going to really worry too much about cameras. They're just going to dump it and go. And I think a lot of the problem is people, even if it's out of the goodness of their heart and leaving stuff, other people are then going through it to see if there's anything worth having and obviously not tidying up after them. I so don't think there's think, any goodness of heart involved here. Dumb. People, well, I understand your frustration, but unless you're going to stand there with a big stick and beat them every time they get out of their car or van, you're not going to stop it. Um, what we're doing is we're talking to the owners of the charity shops any time there's stuff out there to let them know. Um, YMCA has reopened. I know Cancer Research have, or Princess Alice have been going in and out. I don't think they've yeah. reopened yet, but they have been going in and out. YMCA have opened. Shooting Star are now actually messaging me every morning asking if there's stuff outside. So they are taking it quite seriously on that because obviously it's giving them a bad name if their shop's looking horrible in the high street because people will blame them. They won't actually blame the people that are dumping the stuff. Yeah, but also with uh, COVID, they're not going to want to take it into the shop with COVID going on. If you go down there, I don't know if you've actually been there and you've had a lot. Look, every single charity shop has a big notice in the window. I know. Please do not I leave know. donations. What more can they do? Seriously, tell us what they can do and we can tell them. Look, I'm not having a go at the charity shops. No, no, but I'm just saying, if you've got an idea that we can take to them to say, look, someone has suggested doing this to stop it, they're, they're doing what they can. They put no, I'm a, no, sorry, you're misunderstanding me. <laughs> I'm asking if the law can come in on this because it's against the law what they're doing. If they get caught, then yes like anything if they get caught they have to be caught doing it okay that's the problem okay uh, that, but I, I, thank you graham it's it's it's, it's useful no. thank Go you very ahead. much for that it's it's appreciated okay and thank you for your question uh, lula is it's something as i say which is plaguing the whole borough there's this idea that there's a halo around the idea of donations but really yeah it's not uh, okay so Jeremy keats <laughs> Jeremy Keats. We're just looking to see whether we could. There you are. Hello, Jeremy. Question about cycling. Um, yeah, hi. So um, I think the 20 mile an hour scheme is um, very good, it's just so long as everybody actually kept to um, 20 miles an hour. Um, but um, I noticed in the recent submission to TfL, there was no plans for additional cycling infrastructure in Britain. So I just wondered what the kind of the plans and aspirations are of the council and our local councillors to increase the number of people um, cycling in Witten. And I think I'd really like to draw your attention to Percy Road, which is already identified as a road where speeds are very high, lots of cars, lots of islands. It's really dangerous. Uh, and I've had lots of incredibly close encounters with cars. And I think um, for Gareth, just in relation to Turing House, um, the sort of the lack of uh, cycle infrastructure that Turing House were mandated to kind of invest in um, as part of like a section 106 agreement. I just wanted to kind of understand, is that a power the council has? And if so, why weren't Turing House mandated to invest in more cycle infrastructure as part of that major development? Now, now Jeremy, it's, it's, even though I have spoken a lot, it's not about me this evening, but to the person who would know all about Section 106s is, is our Vice Chair of the Planning Committee, Councillor John Coombs, who could tell you all about um, Section 106s and their use. But does anybody want to tackle the broader point of cycling provision, particularly Percy Road? John Coombs, here we go. Yeah, well, I'm only doing that because, because I live in Percy Road. Yeah. And we do have a supposed cycle lane down the side of the road that I live, um, a morning only one. Uh, that was to aid cycling to what was Whitton School and is now Twickenham School. Um, I did in fact ask, I, I had asked for it to be put on the list of those, um, of, of 
lanes that we can look at going forward. As far as I understand it, and I'm sure someone else will correct me if I'm wrong, the schemes that we had, um, that we put in place at the moment, were schemes that were already there because TfL were giving money and the government's given money for schemes that could be instantly introduced. And Percy Road scheme, there has been no work done by uh, uh, traffic engineers um, in the past, apart from painting the white line on the road, that is. Um, so that is why um, currently it is not included because it has to be schemes that are already um, prepared and up and running uh, so the money can be spent instantly. This is what the government and TfL were wanting. But I have actually put it on a list for work to be done so that um, engineers will look at it and see if, if a, uh, a proper cycle lane can be put down Percy Road. Because during this period, um, a lot of people have been using Percy Road to cycle on. And there was a, a very good uh, video made of, um, some, by somebody of cycling down that, um, which um, shows that people wish to do it. Now, when it comes to section 106s, we have to be a bit careful because there's a whole lot of stuff in planning. Um, when you give planning permission, you um, attach a number of conditions to that permission, which the developer has to meet. Um, in certain circumstances, a developer is asked to give money to the council to do certain schemes. This is the section 106 that you mentioned, Jeremy. There are other things that they have to give as well. And those section 106s are for specific things to, uh, to make the scheme work better. So any section 106 that has been given in the Turing House scheme will have to be spent on what it says um, uh, on that planning application. Um, because I was opposing that planning application, I didn't read too much about what the conditions in section 106s were. I'm only dealing with it as and when a new thing comes in. So uh, on that, by the way, you can't put a section 106 on unless it conforms with government planning policies. So what you have to do is look at the national planning framework and work from there on how you can put section 106s on it. So it's not the question of the council saying, oh, here's a nice development, we'll just get a lot of section 106s on it to get some extra money out of it. You actually have to go via what is allowable by government dictate. Okay, Jeremy, would you like to come back on any of that or? Um, I mean, I think um, like just generally kind of cycle infrastructure, I mean, I do understand it's pre-existing kind of schemes, but um, I think particularly with kind of Percy Road, there's a real urgent requirement to do something with that road. You've had the um, speed indicator kind of devices there permanently over many kind of years. So you know that traffic travels down that road too fast. Um, and then with all the kind of the islands, all the kind of the parked cars, it makes it really, really kind of difficult. I mean, I've got a two year old child on the back of my bike and um, like so many kind of uh, horrifying kind of moments, I would say. Um, it really does need to be addressed urgently. And I think even just like low hanging fruit, you've got a cycle lane there, which you can't even use because there's a load of parked cars in it because it's only open for an hour. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could go down tomorrow and change the signage over a subject to a traffic management order. Um, I'm not quite sure what the, um, what the kind of delay is. And um, yeah, I mean, let's not get into kind of cheering house, but I mean, I think it's uh, a missed opportunity within the cheering house application. The school put in incredibly high numbers in terms of like the number of children they were expecting to kind of cycle. If anyone has cycled from Teddington to kind of Witten across three major kind of junctions, you know how ridiculous that was. Um, and so the fact, you know, that they had, you know you've got it, a really poor PTAL kind of rating. And the fact that they weren't mandated to invest in kind of cycle infrastructure seems crazy, particularly now no one is using public transport. 
I, I'm incredibly impressed by your knowledge of terminology, Jeremy. Detail, Section 106, Traffic <laughs> Management, or you've been mo more than most councillors. Councillor Wilson. <laughs> well, I just, uh, I mean, I, I agree. I agree with a lot of what Jeremy just said um, in terms of, uh, uh, unfortunately, we weren't in a position to put anything in uh, because, as, as Councillor Coombe sort of said, um, to use to borrow the phrase, they needed to be shovel ready. Um, but officers have been looking at something for Hospital Bridge Road. I mean, there is, as part of the cheering conditions, uh, there is there are supposed to be improvements being made to the A316 junction. Um, there is obviously the crossing that's going in by Montrose Avenue, and there's also uh, obviously there was the there was the accident which took place recently on the bridge, which Councillor Jaeger alluded to, and it sort of I think there are some obviously some short term uh, things which we can put in place, and then there are other things which are going to be slightly longer term. Uh, but I, I I think I think the positive thing about Hospital Bridge Road is that it is being looked at um, how quickly they'll be able to be. Uh, put into place I, I I can't say but um, I mean I, I've cycled from Teddington to to Witten along that road and I, I you know I, I it's not the safest I know also cycling along Percy Road and then down the high street um, is not the um, is the it's not the easiest I, I really don't like cycling along the high street so um, on the road uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears uh, for potential improvements and um, you know as Councillor Coombe said we, we can look at the Percy Road once and to see if there's anything in relation to the I, I did think the thing which might come into in, into uh, which might help it would have been the CPZ because obviously although the CPZ isn't on Percy Road I thought there might be a with the review it may end up coming into to Percy Road but obviously because that's been delayed um, uh, then you know uh, we've no idea how that would then when when that will happen so um uh, but obviously we've heard uh heard from you that that's something which we'd like to take forward so okay thank you very much thank you jeremy thank you okay we're going to move on to george dryger dryer let's see there's some mute you george just a moment the the, the people on the, the by tech elves don't know your first name i do so there we go, you should be, there we go. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you. Just taking on board the same issues, well, similar issues to on the cycling. Um, just to say that Jubilee Avenue, a wonderful place to live in, by the way, everybody. It's part of the cycle network. Um, but at the end of Jubilee Avenue, we have the A316, where the cycle network joins a sort of a co-joined pathway with footpath. It's a wonderful thing. You can go along there, cycle all, all the way down to Twickenham. The only problem is, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact that we've got vegetation overhanging the pathway and thus causing cyclists and pedestrians to kind of clash with each other, potentially very dangerously. Now, I know that there is a problem with regards to getting the vegetation cut back because I believe it's a problem because it's an ownership issue. It's between mm. TFL and local council. Can you, the local council become very bold and... Uh, Council of Roberts, take the initiative, be very <laughs> sort of environmentally friendly, and go ahead and cut back the bushes. It will do us all a favour. It will also be environmentally friendly, will support cycling and walking. All right, well, the people who live in Hampton may, may well know that I have been known to get me shears out and whip down to the railway right, bridge on, and, just, and just chop the damn stuff back. So, it, one leads by example, George. Who wants to take this on? <laughs> um, oh. The uh, route he's describing is both my usual route to council meetings um, and my son's route to uh, school. And it is quite a problem. My understanding is because it's on a red route, it is TfL's responsibility. But yes. I can certainly see them shoving it on to, pretending it isn't because having worked in a highways uh, department getting a tfl to accept responsibility for everything is always fun um it is clearly a problem and i have become very very opposed to um shared spaces between pedestrians and cyclists um in general um both from personal experience and talking to um, people in the disabled community they would much rather the cyclists were in a segregated lane and personally I think 
um, we need to put in more cyclones and enforce all the bloody ones we have. Um, but it is a problem that when you start doing something, then the person who's responsible will s suddenly forget that it's their responsibility and assume you'll always do it. So I would not like to commit council funds to do something which uh, TfL should be doing. Um, but I'll definitely raise it with um, our cycling champion and um, mm. Alex mm. Um, about trying to push TfL to get um, improvements for the cycle network in that particular stretch because for, purely from a selfish point of view I w want a safer and easier cycle when I when we get back to uh, working in York House. Absolutely. So, Thank can you, Rob. I, can I just say? Yeah, yes, of course, I, John. Can I can I just say that I, I hear that, and I know, you know, joking apart, I do understand there is a, a responsibility of the TfL, but this has been ongoing for a long time, and it's almost like uh, it's, it's, it's where we, the local residents, are stuck between a rock and a hard place because I fully understand that the council doesn't want to do TfL's job, but a TfL, we can wait forever for for various things to happen. Meanwhile, the bushes will carry on growing. And you could end up with an accident waiting to happen. You can't socially distance because you're being crammed into a very small space in certain areas because of the, of the vegetation going on to the A316. So surely, can't we uh, take an initiative and, and say, look, we're doing it for the local good and you'll get a lot of brownie points for it. Yes. is in firm agreement with you there. I mean, one of the ideas that we, we looked at was we were trying to get council officers to perhaps sit down with TfL and talk about areas where it, it is TfL's responsibility, but it, it, it's right next to a piece of, of, of uh, uh, hedges or whatever that are the council's responsibility. And you've got this sort of bizarre situation. I mean, further down the 316, going more towards St Margaret's, you've actually got stretches where there are two patches of grass because you've got, you know, those sort of little side uh, roads that run parallel with the 316, where the inner grass is Richmond Council and the outer grass is TfL. Um, and so certainly one of the ideas that we, we were hoping that they might be able to look at is to sit down with TfL and say, this is crazy that we're sending two lots of, of, of landscapers out to effectively cover within inches of, of, of each other's areas of responsibility. Um, now, obviously, we would want TfL <laughs> to financially contribute uh, to if we were going to take on some of their areas. Um, as I'm sure you're, you're, you're aware, uh, we, we have to be very financially responsible about, about those sort of things. Um, but I think that's certainly a, a conversation that perhaps can happen. Um, and mm. certainly, we all agree with you. Um, and I think we can, we can talk to the right uh, lead council council members and the right uh, council officers to say, is it is it time to, to sit down with TfL? I mean, I know that we've lobbied TfL because it's not just where, where you're saying, um, all the way down and up and down that 316, uh, going through various wards, it's the same issue. Um, and we have had a schedule for, for them, them cutting, uh, cutting it back. Um, but it's obviously not enough, um, and I think we should be, be looking to, to, to see whether there can be some sort of cooperation between the two parties. Okay. I, I guess but one, I, I would, I, I'm heartened by that in a certain way, but can't we just do the job and give TfL the bill? That'll soon sort of... Uh, not until they agree to pay for it. That would, that would not be uh, financially uh, sensible uh, to, to go off and, and spend money without knowing where we're going to get it back in. <laughs> TfL have notoriously deep pockets and short fingers when it comes to this sort of thing. But thanks very much for your question, George. But you can see there is enthusiasm. I don't doubt that this will be taken away by the war councillors for further consideration. Okay, so we're going to move now to Jonathan Douglas Green, who is um, our next question. Hi there. Um, recently moved to the area just before lockdown, and um, we've been we moved to the Woodlawn Estate and. Uh, so follow on question from the pollution question uh, with the cranes. We've been really enjoying the river crane, but um, I noticed a lot of people have been paddling in there uh, recently. And I just wondered if there was a wider um, issue or, or campaign or um, multi-party uh, um, 
approach to controlling pollution in the crane you know, with the Environment Agency and Hounslow and, and others uh, that, that might that might help and certainly might put fewer people at risk um, when they're mm -hmm. out there paddling, not knowing what might be in there. I mean, my understanding is, uh, I can see that Councillor Coombs are coming, but my understanding is that force uh, cover the whole the whole area and reports into them and they liaise a lot with the Environment Agency, but I shall be quiet and let Councillor Coombs take No, Councillor Coombs may tell us who force is, as Jonathan is a new resident. Uh, sorry, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, yeah, I follow them on Facebook, so yeah. You, you do, know, so them, good. Yeah, it's the Friends yeah. of the River Crane Valley. Um, and so it's a voluntary group and they go from Hillingdon right the way through to Hounslow, right the way down the River Crane. And if anything happens on the River Crane, we tend to get in touch with them because the Environment Agency are the people who control the river itself, although the park is obviously a Richmond park. Um, and uh, they do what really good work. Once a month, they have a volunteers Sunday where they work on the river, pulling out weeds, trying to direct the river in the right way. So it's a, it's a really good um, group of volunteers who do an incredible amount of good work on the River Crane. Um, every now and again, we do get these rather horrifying uh, dump into the river from somewhere or the other, which causes a bit of concern. The Environment Agency has spent a huge amount of money stocking the river with little fish, which grow obviously into bigger fish. So. Um, <laughs> It is a, a very good environmental strip. But I, I encourage anybody who's interested to get involved with FORCE, especially their um, uh, volunteer Sundays, where I have been known when I was younger to pull out nutweed and all the other stuff that did it. I'm unfortunately a little too old to do it now. But, um, uh, but well, um, yeah, I was just <laughs> going to say FORCE is the, is the thing. Okay, does that help you, Jonathan? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Right, we're going to move to Khalid Azmi now. Ah, I think Khalid may have left us, which is a shame. Belinda, Belinda. <laughs> I know, I know it's Belinda next. So, Belinda Campbell. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes Councillor Pelletra forgets she has a microphone on. Um, so we have these sort of disembodied voices hanging over the ether. So Belinda Campbell wishes to ask the question about bonfires. Oh, hello, hi, good evening. Hello, how are you? <clears throat> hi, I'm good. I hope you're all well and thank you for letting me speak. Um, I moved to Whitton in 2004, but then into another property in Hounslow Road from 2007 onwards. And I always used to think, right, I must ask the council about this, but I just kept leaving it, you know, bonfire smoke. Um, but then when it was the pandemic, I, I was um, instructed to shield. So I spent nearly five months in my flat. I'm just at my sister's at the moment, house sitting. But a lot of bonfire smoke came in to my living room where I was spending all of my time. And it, it did actually give me a headache. And I thought, gosh, you know, there, there are people at home with COVID on just on paracetamol, coughing probably, um, elderly people, asthmatics, young children. And I just wondered, what um, has anyone ever, I was waiting for other people to complain, to be quite honest, but the, the pandemic made me think, right, I will actually say something now, because it's kind of in your home and um, mm. I, I understand people should be using um, smoke, smokeless coal. Mm. There is an old cottage down Nelson Road in the winter. I've seen smoke billowing out. I didn't really want to be the person to get them into trouble. So I was kind of hoping other people would complain as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, I, I, no, that's fine. You know, get, let somebody else do it. That's the thing. Um, now, so bonfires in general, but also um, smoke free phones there. Anybody? Uh -huh. Leslie. Sorry, can I speak? You can. <laughs> There's a lot of very good information on the Richmond Council website about bonfires, um, about what you can and can't do, or what the council can and can't do, what is considered or deemed to be reasonable ish, and what isn't. 
So uh, if you go onto the website and have a look, there's also, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, an online report um, thing there. That if you can report if it's, for instance, as you said, smoke coming into your home, et cetera, is obviously not acceptable. So I would advise you to go on there and have a look. Yep, absolutely. Um, does anybody have anything that they wish to add? I mean, I was just um, on the council website when the issue of bonfires. Unfortunately, uh, there are no laws on when a resident can have a bonfire at their home. However, right. what you can do, if you find somebody is causing a, well, it's rather pompous phrase, a statutory nuisance, uh, effectively having a bonfire every five minutes, then you can keep details of it, you know, keep a diary, keep a smoke diary, and report them for that. And the council can issue um, prosecutions for statutory nuisance. What we have done is introduced a uh, bonfire ban on our allotments uh, because we can control that. So, but unfortunately in people's own homes, not much that we can do unless they are really going at it hammer and tongs with a bonfire every day, I'm afraid. So um, you're, you're muted. Let me see if I can quickly unmute you. There we go. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you. I mean, no. I just felt like in the COVID, and people were a lot of people were ill because I, I did get quite ill and um, not with COVID but with other things and I just felt you know that was the only place I was spending all of my time in that front room um, the living room so I just thought for others that maybe have got COVID and are at home or elderly or asthmatics or little children I just felt it was what why add more health issues to but I, I understand the situation. But thank you very much for letting me ask a question and answering. Not questions. at all. Thank you. Okay, so I think if I am not mistaken, I'm just going to have a quick look through the list. I think we've finished almost bang on time in terms of the questions. If anybody quickly wishes to have something without wishing to labour a pun on the last question, a burning issue <laughs> that they wish to ask about. Lula, I can see you. All right. I'm, yeah. I'm coming to, there you are. Yeah, so I just want to say that I typed in the word question at 6.30 and then a further five times. So I was a bit concerned that you didn't get that. So does this system not work? I, 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 I wouldn't like to say only for you, Lou. It, it, it's worked <laughs> all, the, all the other way around. It's well, sometimes. I mean, we had to go. I'm doing wrong then. I don't. I honestly don't know. It's, it's sometimes. It's, it's it's the vagaries of technology. Ninety nine percent of the time, it works like a charm, and that one percent sometimes, you know, it it it, it fumbles. Am I the it only person for whom it hasn't worked? And so far, but I'm, I, I'm I'm sure you won't be the last. Sometimes these things just happen. It's, you know, you can't have papal infallibility levels of software. Okay, no problem. So there we go. Okay, right. So it only leaves me to say thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your time this evening. First and foremost, I would like to thank the community engagement teams and the communication teams for um, keeping this whole show on the road and making sure that the videos popped up when they did and making sure that it's thoroughly advertised. And what have you we will be doing more of these don't you worry so there will be further opportunities for you to ask your questions i think we would all like to thank the councillors who've um valiantly fielded the questions this evening so that's john coombs rob o'carroll joe humphreys leslie pleasure liz yeager and michael wilson but as always as always on events such as these it is you who make it so the biggest thanks goes chiefly to yourselves good night <laughs>